Broadway has its Tony Awards. Music has the Grammys. Science has the Nobel Prize, and the Academy Awards recognize achievements in motion pictures. And now we want to welcome you to the 2013 Buncombe Awards, recognizing the lowlights in educational research for the past year. The word Buncombe comes from Buncombe County in North Carolina. Buncombe County produced a congressman, Representative Felix Walker, who gained infamy back in 1820 for delivering a particularly meaningless, irrelevant, and seemingly endless speech. Thus, Buncombe became a term for long-winded nonsense of the kind often seen in politics and education. Hello, I'm David Berliner, a fellow of the National Education Policy Center at the University of Colorado, known as NEPC. At NEPC, our interdisciplinary group of scholars believes that the taxpayers who finance public education deserve smart policies based on sound evidence. Unfortunately, a lot of so-called think tanks working in the field of education are producing something much different half-baked opinions, supported by weak evidence, or no evidence at all. Our winners are the special cases that shine through as prime exemplars of incompetent research. This year, we have six winners. The Do You Believe in Miracles Award goes to the Public Agenda Foundation for their report, Failure is Not an Option how principals, teachers, students, and parents from Ohio's high-achieving, high-poverty schools explain their success. This report from the Public Agenda Foundation claims that certain school-based policies and programs can overcome the impact of poverty on student performance. Among the earth-shaking recommendations they made were engage teachers, be careful about burnout, and celebrate successes. No doubt these are sound practices, but they've been pursued since the authors of this report were in kindergarten, and they don't translate to having failure be not an option. While it may be easy to laugh at the idea that the recommended approaches will somehow overcome the effects of unemployment, bad health care, substandard living conditions, and the like, it is also an outrageous neglect of the fundamental social needs and problems of neighborhoods, families, and children. The truth that these miracle school reports hide is that school failure will almost always prevail in a society that will not invest in disadvantaged communities and the families who live there. In fact, notwithstanding the report's title, four of the nine schools celebrated in the report had poverty rates at the state average and thus were not particularly high poverty schools. Our next award we title we're pretty sure we could have done more with 45 million. It is given to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and its Measures of Effective Teaching Project for their culminating report. We think it's important to recognize whenever so little educational information is produced at such great cost. The Met researchers gathered a huge database reporting on thousands of teachers in six cities. When the Met researchers studied the separate and combined effects of teacher observations, value-added test scores, and student surveys, they found correlations so weak that no common attribute or characteristic of teacher quality could be found. Even with $45 million and a crackerjack team of researchers, they could not define an effective teacher. In fact, none of the three types of performance measures captured much of the variation in teachers' impacts on conceptually demanding tests. But that didn't stop the Gates folks from announcing that they'd found a way to measure effective teaching. Nor did it deter the federal government from strong-arming states into adoption of policies tying teacher evaluation to measures of students' growth. Next on our list is the It's Just Not Fair to Expect PowerPoints to be Based on Evidence Award. We present this award to Patrick Dobard, Superintendent of the Louisiana Recovery School District, and to Elliot Smalley of Tennessee's Achievement School District for their PowerPoint presentations, trumpeting progress in their respective recovery school districts. For years, Jeb Bush's Florida Miracle 
has been unmatched as the most bountiful wellspring of misleading education reform information. But Florida and Jeb have now been overtaken by the Louisiana Recovery School District, which serves the nation as the premier incubator of spurious claims about education reform, and in particular, the performance of recovery school districts, takeovers, portfolio districts, and charter schools. Nothing has stood in the way of Superintendent Dobard, not the dramatic post-Katrina change in student composition, not the manipulation of student achievement standards in ways that inflate performance outcomes, not the unique influx of major funds from foundations, the federal government, and billionaires, and not the unaccounted for effects of a plethora of other educationally relevant factors. But Dobard is not alone. Elliot Smalley, the chief of staff of the Achievement School District in Memphis, touts his school district's level five growth. That certainly sounds impressive, substantially more impressive, for instance, than, say, level three growth, although this growth scale is unfortunately not explained in the PowerPoint itself. What we can say is that a particular school picked by Smalley to demonstrate the district's positive reform effects may not have been the good choice since the overall reading and math scores at that school went down. Picky researchers might also argue that more than seven schools should be studied for more than two years before shouting, hallelujah. As was the case with the Florida miracle, the Buncombe Award here is not for the policy itself. Serious researchers are very interested in understanding the reform processes and the outcomes in these places. Rather, the bunkum is found in the slick sales jobs being perpetrated with only a veneer of evidence and little substance backing up the claims that are being made. Back in the old days, when people thought they had a good idea, they would go through the trouble of carefully explaining their notion pointing to evidence that it worked to accomplish desired goals, demonstrating that it was cost-effective, and even applying scientific method. But that was then, and this is now. And some of the coolest kids have apparently decided to take a bit of a shortcut. They simply announce that all their ideas are fantastic, and then decorate them in a way that suggests an evidence-based judgment. This brings us to our final three Buncombe Award winners, including our grand prize winner, 2013. They all will receive the Look Mom, I Gave Myself an A on My Report Card Award. Second runner-up goes to Students First, which came up with 24 measures based on the organization's advocacy for school choice, test-based accountability, and governance change. Unfortunately, this think tank's state policy report card never quite gets around to justifying these measures with research evidence linking the measures to desired student outcomes. Apparently, the measures are grounded in revealed truth, unseen or unseeable to lesser mortals. <laughs> evidence, though, has never been a requirement for these report card grades. And naturally, the award-winning states embrace the raters' subjective values. In a delightful expose, our reviewers demonstrated that the 50 states received dramatically different grades from a variety of recent report cards. That is, a given state often received a grade of A on one group's list and an F on another group's list. <laughs> and our first runner-up award goes to the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, which almost took the top honors as the most shameful of a bad lot. What makes the ALEC report card particularly laughable is the claim that its grades are research-based. Yes, evidence-based or research-based report card grades would be most welcome, but all ALEC really offers is a compilation of cherry-picked contentions from other advocacy think tanks. Thus, what is put forth as scientifically-based school choice research is actually selective quotations from school choice advocacy organizations, such as Fordham, Friedman, and the Alliance for School Choice. Similarly, the report's claims about the benefits of alternative teacher certification in attracting higher quality candidates are based on only one paper showing higher value-added scores. Unfortunately, that paper was unpublished and the report's reference section led to a dead leak. And now, this year's grand prize winner, 
It's the Brookings Institution and its Brown Center on Education Policy. The breathtakingly fatuous choice and competition rating scale of Brookings is based on 13 indicators that favor a deregulated, scaled-up school choice system. And the indicators are devoid of any empirical foundation suggesting these attributes might actually produce better education. Since the mere construction of this jaundiced and unsupported scale would leave us all feeling shortchanged, Brookings has also obliged its audience with an application of its index to provide an evaluation of New York City's choice system. Where an informative literature review would conventionally be presented, the authors of this New York City report touchingly extol the virtues of school choice. They then claim that gains in New York City were due to school choice while presenting absolutely nothing to support this causal claim. <laughs> and following from this claim and from their exquisite choice and competition rating scale, they offer the expected recommendations. Seldom do we see such a confluence of self-assured hubris and unsupported assertions. It's hard to find words that capture this spectacular <laughs> display except to say, congratulations, Brookings. You just won the Buncombe's grand prize for shoddiest educational research for 2013. Thanks for joining us. And be sure to visit us at nepc.colorado.edu to find out what's good, what's bad, and what's ugly in the world of think tank research about education. I am sure we'll see you next week.